So hey everybody, hope you guys are having a good one. And I'm here today to talk a bit about tax reform. Now, I've done a bit of this on the last few episodes, largely in relation to the United States. Talking a bit about how Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez have sort of shifted the narrative in the United States, which has, you know, since the 1980s been you know, utterly obsessed with lowering taxes for the, the richest people uh, under this supposed belief, which was bipartisan, maybe not evenly, but broadly bipartisan, this belief that, you know, if you uh, leave the rich unrestrained, you will unleash their creative and entrepreneurial passions and skills and you know, through trickle-down economics, they'll make everybody richer. And I think we realized that that's bull, and I think that politicians like Ocasio-Cortez and Sanders and Warren, through their various policies, have shown that we need to move away from that now generations-old model. And so whether it's higher income taxes, as we've seen from Ocasio-Cortez, or whether it's a, an estate tax increase like we've seen from Bernie Sanders, or whether it's a wealth tax that we've seen proposed by Elizabeth Warren, the reality is, is that there's new policy discussions there. But I want to shift the focus back to Canada on this video. That's where I want to put the focus for a couple reasons. I f first, I, f I feel in some ways that, you know, the Canadian elite often get, they often get off easy. That the, the, the size of the American elite, the, the amount of billionaires and, and multi-multi-millionaires that they have, and just the kind of fame and sometimes infamy of the American elite allows a lot of Canada's richest people to sort of hide in the shade a little bit, to sort of be covered, to sort of be sheltered from a lot of the criticism. And, you know, so much of our media, so much of our, of our coverage of society is, you know, looks towards the United States that we often fail to examine some of the things at home. And so I think that in Canada, we haven't had these discussions to the same extent in recent years. But there is hope on a couple fronts. And I think I want to do two things in, in, in exploring this, this potential phenomenon. One is to talk a bit about an exciting new poll that, that came out just this weekend, which demonstrates at least preliminarily some support from Canadians, pretty broad support, for increasing taxes on the wealthiest people. And two, I want to talk a bit about how we can achieve that and how that probably, really almost certainly, would have to come from the New Democratic Party, have to come from the NDP, because it's very unlikely to come from any other source politically. So first we should talk a bit about this poll. I don't know if you saw this, but you know it broke on Saturday, this, this poll from ECOS, which demonstrated uh, based off two questions that a significant amount of Canadians feel the rich should pay more. You know, I'll put this on the screen, uh, you know, while I'm talking about this. But um, ECOS reports that, you know, when, when talking about a 70% tax bracket, they ask this question. The top marginal tax rate in Canada is about 50%. In 1971, the rate was approximately 80%. To what extent would you support or oppose taxing all income over $1 million at 70%? So basically what they're asking there is similar to Ocasio-Cortez's top marginal tax rate increase of, you know, up to 70% at $10 million, we would here in Canada do the same thing but at $1 million. Again, to, you know, dis dispel any confusion, that doesn't mean the entirety of the $1 million would be taxed at 70%. Rather, it would be every dollar above that one millionth dollar. So if you, you know, you would be taxed at a lower rate, you know, on the income all earned up to that millionth dollar. But if you earn, say, $2 million a year, the second half of your salary would be taxed at 70%. And when that question was asked, about a quarter of the people opposed it. And about a fifth of the people give or take, we're unsure. But half of the those respond half of those polled said they support a increased 
top marginal tax rate on the on the wealthiest Canadians. And again, it should be it should be underlined. This isn't at 10 million or 5 million or 3 million, but at 1 million. So in some ways there's perhaps a greater appetite for taxing well-off Canadians than there is well-off Americans, uh, especially when you consider the fact that we'd be starting that at a much lower level than Ocasio-Cortez is proposing. Um, now, of course, these polls are prelimin preliminary. The uh, sample size was only about 423 people, but even when you include the margin of error and you kind of maximize the margin of error, it's still clear that a, that a majority of Canadians essentially um, support, you know, raising taxes on the wealthy in, through the, the traditional means of income, um, nearly double those who oppose it. And if we look at a wealth tax, see, this is, this is more interesting, I think, because, you know, income taxes are important, don't get me wrong. But it would sort of just be tweaking what's already there, adding new brackets, raising the amount we tax on a given bracket. You know, those are discussions that are important, but they're all about pulling levers, all about tweaking the dials. But when we talk about a wealth tax, it's about creating a new dial. It's about building a new lever. And I think that's what's very interesting. And the poll asked a question about a wealth tax. Here is that question. A wealth tax is a tax based on the total value of all the assets that someone owns, including bank accounts, real estate, business ownership, and stocks. Canada currently does not have a wealth tax. To what extent would you, would you support or oppose introducing a 2% wealth tax on all personal assets over $50 million and a 3% wealth tax on all personal assets over $1 billion? And here you see broader support, much broader, I would say. Um, and this is much more similar to the Warren proposal, who, again, when talking about her wealth tax, started it, I believe, at these exact amounts, at, at $50 billion and then adding a, an additional percent at $1 billion. So really going after not just the, 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 90, the 1%, but really going after the, the fractions of that 1%. And here you see 69% support for that position. Only 11% of people are unsure and only 17% of people oppose it. So it's a super majority, more than two thirds of those polled, support a wealth tax on the, very, on the very richest Canadians. And that's rather substantive. That's rather substantive. Again, it's difficult in, in politics, you know, to get 70% of people to agree to something. And when you have 70% of a people to agreeing, agreeing to something, it's clear that you must have at least some support across the political spectrum. Now, you would wager, of course, that a majority of those people in that 69% would come from, the, you know, the non-conservative parties, but it's likely that at least a few conservatives, at least a few of the people who voted for Doug Ford, and a few of the people who are planning to vote for Andrew Scheer, are in that camp. They're in that camp of, of wanting to tax the rich more taxing them more um, on their wealth, not just on, on income. So where does that leave us? Well, it leaves us in an interesting position, I would say. It leaves us in an interesting position because these are clearly popular policies, and yet neither of the two biggest parties, the Liberals or the Conservatives, would go anywhere near either of these proposals. And that I don't think even the Green Party, for instance, would. The Green Party might look at raising income taxes. Obviously, they might support certain levies that have an environmental kind of theme to them. But there's only one party that I think this could come from. And that's the New Democratic Party. That's Jagmeet Singh's NDP. And I say that for a couple reasons. One, some of these proposals have roots, long roots, in New Democratic Party proposals going back to the 60s and 70s. And it's also the case that Jagmeet ran his leadership campaign in part on a suite of tax proposals that would aim at reducing inequality in this country. Now, it's not a one-to-one -one match here. There are some things that he wanted to do that aren't included amongst these two polls, and he didn't necessarily want to do the two things in this poll. But in general, he ran on a kind of policy of tax reform. And I think that's very important because I think he has the sort of mandate from his party and I think his party has the sort of ideological orientation that they could take these sorts of policies, a wealth tax and, you know, very high top marginal tax rates and meld them with Jagmeet's policies. And Jagmeet had 
kind of four broad tax reform policies. The first was an increase to the income tax for people making uh, 300000 or more and to another bracket 500000 or more. But the increases were much more modest. We're talking, you know, less than, far less than 10% increase. It wouldn't necessarily bring us back to the, you know, uh, 70%, 80% level. So at that point, he's a bit more modest, of course. And he does not include a wealth tax. That wasn't part of his proposal. He does not want a kind of standing tax on wealth. But there were two things that he proposed which sort of address the broad concerns that a wealth tax and a very high top marginal tax rate, you know, aim to, to, to address. And that is a capital gains uh, tax increase, and that is a estate tax. And so a capital gains tax increase here really means that Jagmeet is going to narrow the window. He's proposing to narrow the window between how capital gains are taxed and how labor income is taxed. And currently, we give a sort of advantage to capital gains. If you sell stock, let's say you bought a stock, you bought 50000 worth, doubled in value, you sold it, and you made 50000 profit. Now, you pay taxes on that profit because that's income, but it's capital gains income and not labor income, and therefore, you're only taxed on half the value of those capital gains. Whereas, if you, say, go to a job 9 to 5, you know, and make 50 grand, you're taxed on, you know, the full amount of that income. Uh, there is no kind of, uh, you know, exclusion there. And so it seems like, in some ways, the sort of ways that regular people, the people who earn the vast majority of their income through, through work, make their money, and the sort of ways that some wealthy people do, which is through stock trading and, 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 and selling very expensive goods at profits, you know, things of that sort are taxed quite lower, at least on a percentage basis. So Jagmeet is saying, look, I'm going to raise the levy from 50% to 75%. Now, it doesn't get us all the way towards a one-to-one -one ratio, what you might call the buck is a, a buck is a buck proposal that, you know, the NDP supported in the late 60s, early 70s. But it does narrow the gap, and it would be a tax that would overwhelmingly affect, you know, wealthier people. Because, you know, you could balance it out at the bottom end by saying that, you know, we'll have an exemption for, you know, people who have very small total capital gains amounts per year. But that really would strike, a you know, at, at the, a situation where somebody earns very little labor income. And yet, because they earn a high level of income through capital gains, ends up paying a very small proportional tax bill because of the exclusion. But I think more relatable to these discussions is Jagmeet's estate tax policy. And what he wanted to do was raise a 40% estate tax on all those estates worth $4 million or more. Now, that excludes the family home. That excludes the kind of principal residence of the family. But it does mean that any estate that is, you know, a wealthy person's estate will pay nearly half of the estate's value in taxes, you know, when it's, when it's passed on. And this is a way to raise money, of course. But it's also, again, as I've discussed here, strikes a blow for equality of opportunity because one of the barriers towards equality of opportunity is you know massive intergenerational wealth and the transfer of that wealth and if you can tax it at significant levels at 40 percent for instance you at least mitigate one's ability to you know generation after generation just pass on gains and then create these sorts of barriers between uh, people who were, according to the principles and values of our sort of our of our society, should have been given equal opportunity, should have been born created equal, and yet when somebody has billions of dollars and someone lives on social assistance from the day they're born, we know that those people do not have anywhere near uh, something approaching equality of opportunity. So this is why I feel Jagmeet Singh and the NDP are the only party poised to jump on some of these issues, jump on the policies that Sanders and Warren and Ocasio-Cortez are mainstreaming in the United States, and jump on the policies that, as we've seen, are at least, again, at least on preliminary data, quite popular in Canada with broad swaths of the electorate. And even if, you know, it ends up being that it's only popular with 40, 45% of Canadians, let's say, well, that's a substantive amount of people. And in our election, you know, in our electoral system, 
you know, flawed as it is, the one that Justin Trudeau promised to change, but, but, but didn't. 40% of the people supporting you, that's a majority government. So Jagmeet Singh can very well say, look, there's a, there's a, a, a large part of our country. It could be a small majority or it could be a large plurality of people really support increasing taxes on the rich. Their income taxes, wealth taxes, I'm sure that I could sell my estate tax as a form of wealth tax and generate uh, support. I'm sure that I could sell my capital gains increase as a sort of tax on you know, you know, non-working class income and generate support for that. And so I need to make that my focus. And I think one of the challenges thus far is Jagmeet has had that tax policy in his back pocket. It's been part of his platform when he ran for the leadership, but he hasn't emphasized it as much as I think he could. And I think that that's one of the reasons why, right now at least, there's a hunger for taxing the rich in Canada, but there's not necessarily somebody offering it. And again, the conservatives would probably never raise taxes on the rich. The liberals, you know, as they did in 2015, I could see them knocking up, you know, income taxes a few points here and there on the very wealthiest, knowing, I think, quite perceptively that, you know, the rich, you know, can afford to lose a couple percent, but also that as long as you avoid, you know, estate or capital gains or wealth taxes, you're actually not striking at the, the main, you know, bases of the Canadian 1%'s actual wealth. So Justin Trudeau can say, offer a small income tax increase, wipe his hands and say, look, I've made Canada more equal, but the rich people still get to keep the vast majority of their income that they've earned and the vast majority of their income going forward. And I think right now Canadians are, are, are ready, they're primed for a message of tax fairness. They're primed for bold, exciting tax policy. They're primed for a policy that will not only strike a blow for equality in raw terms, will not only over the long term make Canada a society with greater equality of opportunity, but will offer a, a clear sense that the NDP, that progressives, can pay for the sorts of social programs we need. Again, the NDP is going to run on ambitious policies this time. Jagmeet Singh has promised a national pharmacare program. And while over the long term, that program really will save money, you know, ensuring that Canadians have the pharmacare they need, the medicine they need, will save us many long-term headaches over the sorts of care that happens, um, sort of the care that's required when you don't get that medicine and you end up in the outpatients or you don't get that medicine and you end up in the ER. You know, those long-term savings are going to matter. But in the immediate term, we will need money to build these ambitious programs. We will. We'll need money to build pharmacare. We'll need money to build dental care. We'll need money to build a universal child care program. We'll need money for that. And one of the things we can do is raise money on the wealthiest Canadians. And again, it doesn't just have to be through income. Income probably won't be enough. There's not a whole lot of very, very, very high earning Canadians. And you know, tax increases on that alone might not be enough to get us there. But when you start to look at wealth, and you start to look at estates, and you start to look at capital gains, that's when you start to be able to really strike uh, you know, uh, a blow to this narrative that we just can't afford these social programs. Again, we built ambitious social programs you know, before, during, and after World War II. Times where perhaps the economy was hot in some of those cases, but where if you look at our real GDP, we're much richer now. You know, many workers aren't. Wages kind of lag behind the general opulence of the 1%, of course. But Canada, if you add up our per capita GDP, is a very wealthy society. If we could afford Medicare 50 years ago, 60 years ago, we can afford dental care now. We can afford child care now. We can afford pharma care now. And if we can't afford it with our current budgetary structure, it's not because we lack the means. It's because our governments have lacked the will to raise the funds needed. And that these forms of taxation are the way to do it. 
So my call is, and again, I do this as a, as a member of the New Democratic Party. Uh, you know, I am a, a supporter of that movement. I hold a, you know, vice presidency and a riding association in that movement. So I come at this as a, as a loyal person to this party. And I am asking for us to take the torch on tax fairness into 2019. We don't have to recreate the wheel. There are policies that are happening in the United States that we can examine and tweak and roll out. And there are policies that Jagmeet ran on in this recent leadership election that he can reignite. The opportunity is there. Justin Trudeau has failed progressives. Andrew Scheer stands with the economic elite. Right now, Jagmeet Singh can seize the day. Let's hope he does it.